Welcome back to Negotiate With Yourself and Win with me, Jeremy Sherman, and me, Jeremy Sherman, a cradle-to-grave perspective on you, on us, on the whole ball of wax, cradle at the origins of life, grave at today's grave situation, like waking up to what we've become in no time. After what scientists have shown to be a whole lot of time, 14 billion years for the universe, 3.8 billion years for life, and then lucky us, just in time to witness some pretty perilous threats to life. Witness? Participate in the peril. Yeah, thanks a lot, humans. But don't blame us. When you take in the grand sweep of it all, it makes sense that we'd have gotten here. If not humans, then some other species with our talents particularly our talent for language, which makes us a different kind of beast. Right, more visionary and more delusional. Able to foresee and to close our eyes to whatever we see that freaks us out. With language, we can talk ourselves out of facing our predicaments, but also talk ourselves out of predicaments with careful reasoning, which we'll try to do here today, though not about language. We'll get to how language changes us in another episode, an explanation for why, after a really slow start, humanity is suddenly rolling like a dumpster roller coaster on fire. Yeah, today we're rolling our sleeves back up for a second round on the origins of life. The Cradle. This is the second of four episodes we'll do on the subject, which is a lot. Yeah, we have to take our time about it because it's a slippery question. Easy to slide off into some simple solution that doesn't solve it. Okay, so here goes. Remember from last time, I'm me now. And I'm me a few decades ago. Here goes. Okay, I slept off that headache you caused me the other day. Did you toss and turn? Shut up. Just yanking your chain. So, you want to try another round on this? Sure, knock yourself out. Okay, here's where we got, I think. Your body is made of chemistry like everything else. We visited ways that maybe something else is breathed into that chemistry to make it come alive. Right, not by God, but by some spirit or force. Yeah, and I challenge that. Forces are physical. But when you say spiritual force, I don't think you meant physical. Not physical, not God, but still something that creates us. Creates like is trying to create us? Yeah, making effort. See, I know it's popular these days to say you don't believe in God, but you're spiritual. I don't think that solves anything. It still implies something behaving like a someone, trying to breathe life into us. However vast or disembodied you imagine the great spirit to be, you're still implying a supernatural self making effort to bring us alive. Yeah, I've been thinking about that. It's why I want to give this another hearing. I need to know how science explains the miracle of life. Maybe more like a magic trick than a miracle? Miracles can't be explained. Magic tricks are mysterious to their audience, but there is an explanation. But doesn't a magic trick imply a magician? If there's no one creating us, there's also no one trying to trick us. Great point. My mistake. You're absolutely right. So not a miracle, not a magic trick, but a mystery that should be solvable. I remain skeptical that it can be solved. Scientists tend to overreach, like they can solve everything. Science is a campaign, a a game you could say, that you can play if you choose. If you do, within the game, you're going to be looking for natural explanations for all natural phenomena, including selves and efforts. So I get a choice? I can go with the supernatural explanation, like God or a higher power that adds something to chemistry, or I can go with science, which which has no room for supernatural explanations. Science holds out for a natural explanation. And yes, look around you. You'll find people who opt in and out of the game, and people who cherry-pick, agreeing with science when science agrees with them, and dismissing science when it doesn't. And why aren't supernatural explanations permitted in science? Because if you can explain cells with something supernatural, what can't you explain that way? Like, why do we get cancer? Because there's a cancer spirit that breathes cancer into us. Or why is there lightning? Because there's a supernatural force breathing magical lightning something into the skies. But scientists don't know for sure that there are no supernatural forces. That's right. There's no way to know for sure whether there are or aren't. But what about signs of the supernatural? Paranormal, for example. The signs would still be natural. Imagine that we wake up one morning to clouds spelling, I'm God, my signature here proves it. The clouds would be natural, not supernatural. 
by definition, the supernatural is beyond nature, beyond detection by our senses or instruments. If there were supernatural forces, there's no accessing them ever. But a natural sign could be like a clue to what's going on in the supernatural realm. All sorts of people interpret all sorts of natural signs as clues about what's going on in some supernatural realm. Different natural signs, different supernatural claims, but no way to resolve them. So people duke it out with no way to decide who's right because the signs they experience were natural and what they claim they're about is beyond the natural, in the supernatural, where there's no access to evidence one way or another. I sidestep that bickering over the shape of God by just saying it's a higher power, a shapeless force. I don't bet you sidestep much with that argument. The claim that it's shapeless is not going to be acceptable to someone who insists on God's shape. And besides, it's not its shape, but what it wants that matters, what it's trying to achieve. I believe the higher power wants love, harmony, tolerance, letting go, you know, good things. What's good by your standards? No, by everybody's standards. Really? Think about it. Religious terrorists claim to be guided by a higher power. Yeah, but they're wrong. By our standards, yes. Our standards are better says us. They say theirs are better, and you and they both claim authority by association with the great decider, the supernatural something and what it wants. But I do it for a good cause. Yeah, but if you allow name-dropping a supernatural master for what you think is a good cause, what's to keep someone else from name-dropping a supernatural master for what you think is a bad cause? Science sidesteps that debate. Maybe we can find a natural explanation for all the natural phenomena, including ourselves and our effort. But maybe scientists won't be able to find a natural explanation. You're right, maybe. But scientists will keep looking for a natural explanation until they find one. I like that campaign. I choose science rather than saying, who knows, or joining the fray that claims a supernatural source. Okay, got it. Go on. From a scientific perspective, the question comes down to this. If, like chairs, stones, computers, or rivers, we're nothing but chemistry, no miracles, nothing violating physical law, no supernatural additive, what explains me and my effort? Right, we got that far. Selfhood and effort are something different, yet from nothing but chemistry. What? What makes that difference? Yeah, yeah, I get it. So doesn't my selfhood and awareness start with my human consciousness, my self-awareness? I think it starts earlier than that. Do dogs make effort? Oh, yeah, sure. And trees? Mm, I don't know. Well, aren't they trying to stay alive and reproduce? But they have no consciousness or feelings. True, but you would say that the tree is trying to stay alive, right? Effort? Okay, that sounds all right. Trees make effort. How about plants, fungus, or bacteria? Wait, I don't get it. How do you mean effort? Is it the same as trying? Sure, trying, striving, but not necessarily with all the bells and whistles we associate with human trying. Darwin called it the organism's struggle for existence. Basically, selves making effort to keep existing, effort to prevent their own non-existence. Didn't Darwin solve it? Not really, and he as much as admitted that he didn't. He assumed the struggle for existence. He was just trying to explain how the struggle changes across species and over time. Well, haven't evolutionary biologists solved it since Darwin? Evolutionary theory has made great strides since Darwin. Natural selection is called the central dogma of biology, the keystone concept. That's a solid endorsement. But the origins of life? Scientists are still speculating. It's a mystery yet to be solved. Then what are we talking about? I thought you said science could explain it. I think it can, but not with natural selection. And you're saying that effort doesn't have to be conscious. Or felt. I mean, bacteria don't feel anything. But they try to prevent their own deaths. And heck, a huge amount of my effort is unconscious and unfelt. I don't even really know what my spleen does. But still me making my effort. I regenerate cells all day. I pump blood. And do I notice? Do I have to think about it? Okay. If effort doesn't have to be conscious or felt... Yeah, I guess. Plants, fungus, bacteria, they make effort. And how about molecules and atoms? Are they selves making effort? Are they trying to do anything? Hmm. Chemistry? Oh, yeah, no. By your weird standards, chemicals aren't making effort. True, my weird standards. But I think the alternatives are weirder. Such as, like that everything is making effort. Like that the molecules in this table are struggling for their existence. 
Molecules do bind together. Sure, and when I pound the table, they respond by bouncing around a little. You could imagine it as though they're holding on to each other for dear life. But are those molecules struggling to exist, trying to prevent their own non-existence? I don't think so. So you're drawing the line between chemistry and life. And we all do, or else we'd be worried about hurting a stone's feelings. Wait, we eat plants and animals. You can't tell what's alive by whether we worry about hurting their feelings. Right, stupid standard. My mistake. And anyway, little kids worry about hurting stuffed animals' feelings. Okay, but I get you. By your standards, chemicals aren't struggling for their existence. Right, by my weird but not weirdest standards, I draw the line between chemistry and life. I think we all do. Chemistry and biology are different fields, playing by different rules. So you're saying that organisms and only organisms are trying to evolve. I don't think most organisms are trying to evolve. Trying to evolve is more like learning. Wait, if organisms aren't trying to evolve and there's no purpose in the universe, what is trying to make us evolve? Actually, I don't think anything is for most of life's history. Well then, why say that organisms make effort? Because from the emergence of life onward, organisms are struggling to keep on keeping on, struggling to prevent their own non-existence, and passing on that struggle for existence to their offspring. Humans try to evolve, but that's not the general rule. What all organisms do is try to not die. Try and fail, ultimately. Yes, but not before passing on that struggle to offspring, or it'd be the end of the line. We die, and yet look at us. 3.8 billion years of these soft, fragile organisms here on Earth, and not a single life-terminating accident leaving us with a sterile planet. That implies some hustle. Not to evolve, but to keep going. That's the fundamental effort, I'm guessing, the struggle to prevent our non-existence. You know you could be wrong about all this. Ah, I'm glad you brought that up. I could indeed. That's some of the peace of mind I've gotten from thinking about all this. How so? That tree is trying to survive and reproduce. You could be wrong about how to do it. It could guess wrong when to flower or when to shed its leaves. It could be wiped out by disease. A tree isn't guessing consciously or emotionally what to do, but a tree is still a guess, a trial in life's trial and error process. Effort is guesswork. Trying can fail. And me, I'm on a brittle branch of the same guesswork tree of life. It's not like humans or know-it-alls ever escape the uncertainty. We never know it all. There is no formula to be discovered that would make us infallible. Huh. I think that's the hardest news from evolutionary theory. Not that we descended from apes, not that God isn't needed in order to explain selves and effort, but that there's no surefire formulas. I'm relieved, actually. I'm not trying to find the one right formula, the master plan that will guarantee me success. I've, I've given up on that. I try to make the best educated guesses I can, knowing that they're just guesses and can't be anything but guesses because life is guesswork. Effort is guesswork. You can't play the game of science without the possibility that you have spent your entire life barking up the wrong tree, betting on a guess that turns out wrong. I'm fine with that. I don't know. I think I'd miss the grounding. Yeah, but there are advantages. Look, I can no longer be shocked into doubt by someone saying, you know you could be wrong. Damn right I could. So could anyone. And no one can claim the higher ground by suggesting that I could be wrong. So could they. That they notice that I could be wrong doesn't mean that they're right by default. We're all guessing. And that's why your sleepless nights are less sleepless? Exactly. Late on sleepless nights, I do wonder what to do and whether I'm living wrong. Like you do. Like, like anyone. And everybody does. But then I nod off because I know it's guesswork. No formula. Just be trying best I can. Even if I bet right it could turn out wrong. I could bet on the better odds, and there's still odds. I could bet on 95% probability, and the 5% could still be what results. And you get that by thinking about trees as selves making effort. Not just, but, well, you'll see. If you make the effort to follow this line of reasoning, and if it makes sense to you, and yes, you could definitely decide that I'm wrong. Where were we? Hey, what about machines? Do they make effort like a computer? Well, what's your guess? By your standard, the question is whether they're struggling for their existence, trying to prevent themselves from not existing. Exactly. Well, in a way, yes. They're created to be useful so we won't throw them away. Created by human effort. 
You said struggling for existence. You say anything about effort being a function of something being created or engineered. What? You have a prejudice against engineered life? Right. Good point. There's no reason us effortful beings couldn't create an effortful self. Happens all the time. Living beings create offspring. Right. Different from making a computer. But to your point, if a computer is designed to be useful and therefore to be used a long time, is that the same as the computer struggling to prevent its own non-existence? Actually, computers are different. They don't produce offspring. Right, and I'd say they're just useful tools for us, useful mechanisms created through the effort of humans to aid the effort of humans. But they do things that humans do, like calculate. Sure, they automate tasks, and we automate tasks too, like instincts or habits. We find formulas that work well enough. Very few guesses rise to the level of consciousness or even feeling, like the feeling of doubt. Most of our guesses have been settled into know-how, like me knowing how to regenerate cells or even to drive while thinking about other things. Well, if we automate tasks and computers automate tasks, why aren't computers selves making effort? Remember the standard, struggling on their own behalf, struggling to prevent their own non-existence. I don't think any computers today do anything of the kind. I don't think cars or planes or drones are selves either, even though they help our effort. Okay, okay. So set aside computers and other machines for now. They're not making effort as you define it. They're not selves. Yeah, there's more to it than that. But I don't count tools as selves making effort, even if we interact with them like they're selves making effort. Your point earlier, kids act like stuffed animals are real. Okay, okay, I'll go with your standard. All living beings are selves making effort. And you're saying that bodies are chemistry and chemistry doesn't make effort. Still, a body is a self that makes effort. So what makes a body a self? Close, but not quite. Tell me, when a living body dies, are those chemicals all still there? Sure. At first, before they break down. There was a rumor that at death, bodies lose a little weight, but that was disproven. All right. So is the self the body? Well, selfhood and effort happen in bodies, but when the body dies, the self and effort are gone while the body and all its chemicals remain. Whoa. Okay, so you're saying I'm not my body. We talk about it both ways. I can say I am my body or I have my body. I can say this arm is me or this arm is mine. And you think, I don't think I'm my body. To say I have it isn't quite right either. I mean, it's fine as a figure of speech, but I don't have my body the way I have my computer. I don't think my selfhood could exist without my body. If your self can't exist without your body and your self is gone when you die, where does the self go? My selfhood is not a material thing, nor can it exist disembodied. So I think it's very likely that when I die, my self is just gone. But yes, I know that sounds absurd, or at least ice cold, but you'll see how I get there. And am I really there? Of course not in my heart. I'm self-obsessed like everyone else. Really, hardly anything matters to me more than myself, and yet I'm still convinced I just disappear at death. No more me. I think it's funny, this tension I live with. I even wrote a blues tune. I'm sure going to miss me when I'm gone, even though that's absurd. The whole thing's absurd and very entertaining. So like a soul, spirit, or life force, right? That's there while you're alive and... And simply no longer exists when I'm dead. And saying that you're not your body, you're okay calling yourself your soul or your spirit? It's not very scientific. Those names are fine. And if you want to call them something more scientific, you could call yourself an agent, an individual, living being, organism, an interiority. Whatever you call it, two things. It's not your body, and whatever you name it, naming it is not explaining it. Naming is not explaining... I think I get it. I could give a name to whatever there is about my body that makes the effort, but naming it wouldn't mean I know what it is. That's the mystery we're trying to solve. Here, imagine that I opened the hood of the car and found a big something in there. I didn't know how it worked. I called it a motion maker. Naming is not explaining. To explain the motion maker, I'd have to know how it worked. And you're trying to figure out the effort-making thing that is us. We say souls or selves make effort because they have motivations, appetites, drives, needs, wants, desires, cravings, intentions, whatever. That's like saying a car is real, but whatever makes it go is the motion maker. And naming is not explaining. Exactly. Ask scientists what a motivation is and they can't tell you. 
They can tell you about what motivations do, but that's like saying the motion maker in a car makes motion. Scientists know motivations by their consequences. They can tell you that motivations happen in your body. They can tell you all about the chemical mechanisms that manifest the motivations. But a motivation, what is it? It's there when you're alive and gone when you're dead. A motivation has no mass, no volume, no boundaries. It's weird. I've thought about that with minds. Like, from what I understand, scientists have never been able to find a master controller, like Mind Central. And I thought it's kind of weird for all we know about brains and body parts. You'd think, you'd think we'd know. That's right. And that's the mystery you're on about here, indeed. Okay, again, enough already. If we're getting together soon, I don't mind taking this back up again. But I'm, I'm done for now understandably, and I still can't get over that somehow thinking about this stuff has helped you stay more contented. Some from what I'm finding out, but some too probably from just having something really interesting and big to wonder about. It takes my mind off my personal woes. Like if I had some other consuming preoccupation, I'd gain some peace of mind. But this one really speaks to me. I'm willing to hear you out. We'll talk. I'm sure gonna miss me when I'm gone I've been crying for years after I say my last so long the enemy will be my biggest tragedy Sure gonna miss me when I'm gone I'll admit that I've been a real slow starter Only now am I getting any smarter So when my time has come I'm not guessing I feel dumb I'm Sure gonna miss me when I'm gone up to now, I've only been improving Better with age and with schooling I'm not too far ahead See, I'm gonna soon be dead I'm sure I'll miss me when I'm gone I sing my final song The mortal death of me Will be my biggest tragedy I'm sure gonna miss me when I'm gone They say the dead lose their leases Their whole world explode to pieces From what I see That's just so wrong for me I'm sure gonna miss me when I'm gone Wasted time, I'm going too slow. Learning things I now already know. Now that I'm wise, that seems such a compromise. I'm sure gonna miss me when I'm gone. Sweet soul's release. The longer that I'm living, the 
less I want to give and I'm sure gonna miss me when I'm gone. After death, I'll crave rejuvenation, but older means I'm smarter. After life is an unstarter, sure gonna miss me when I'm gone. I like to maintain a cheerful state, even when the circumstances aren't so great. Still, death, what a curse! I can't imagine one much worse. I'm sure gonna miss me when I'm gone. I'm sure gonna miss me when I'm gone. I'll be crying for years after I say my last so long. The end of me will be my biggest tragedy. I'm sure gonna miss me when I'm gone. 